I've put together just a set of slides about raking leaves that I'm not going to speak to. Um, because when Hamad asked me to prepare for this panel, it was a sort of come and speak about um, raking leaves, but from the position of setting up an organization in the UK at a particular time. And what I have done is prepared a few notes about that, so it's not a conversation um, or not a presentation about raking leaves, so hence the slides that will roll behind you. But the second thing Hamad, I think, wanted me to reflect on was um, setting up what I did with raking leaves, and perhaps what he didn't mention in his opening, um, his intro, is that I no longer live in the UK. I left uh, four or five, year, or five years ago. Um, I'm now based in Sri Lanka. I say that nice and loudly because um, there is, I think, one of the points I'm going to make, um, something that um, I think is um, really missing from this conversation. Um, so I live in Sri Lanka and I divide my time between being there and in New York. So far, everything that has been uh, talked about on, th on the panel so far um, has focused on projects um, which have been exhibition-based from the point of view of institutions or from um, reviews of, of, of such projects by the curators themselves. And this um, is perhaps what is a little different and what I'm going to speak about is I'm talking about an organization um, that I set up uh, called Raking Leaves. And I set the organization up in the UK in 2008. And um, it was here based in, um, based in England until 2012. It's now no longer the case. It's now based in Sri Lanka. And I want to talk about something quite mundane to begin with which is the funding situation that brought Raking Leaves into being. The day before Raking Leaves launched, it was invited to become an RFO. I'm um, not very familiar any longer with the funding system in the UK after five years of not living here, but the RFO, I think, has changed its um, wording, but RFO referred to regularly funded organization. And it was a... Um, uh, invitation to become part of a funding system which involved three years of funding for the organization um, and it was going to join what was seen as a portfolio of other really, um, in my eyes, um, very important arts organizations across the UK. Um, so to be part of this portfolio and that um, was, it was an invitation that was uh, something I could not really have um, imagined, let alone dream dreamt of. It was a big change also because up until that point, um, most of the work that I had been doing um, really got its funding from um, work that met the agendas which were, collect uh, which were connected to cultural diversity to then, in the 80s, multiculturalism, that was a, um, a term that was, was, was really used from within, I'm talking about the funding cycles and the Arts Council, all the work that I was doing was supported by equal opportunities, grants, or initiatives. So that, w that was just where my work had, had been funded from, and then here I was setting up an organization and getting funding from a very different pot of money. So the question I'd like to, um, I suppose, raise and put out there is what are the differences between organizations that are supported by RFO funding, um, I'm sorry if that terminology has now changed, I believe it has, um, that is different to organizations that are born out of cultural diversity funds. Um, historically, um, I'm thinking of organizations like Inova that was a um, initiative of the Arts Council from within the Arts Council. It was about funding. It was about three kinds of franchises that grew into an institution. I'm talking about um, projects like Rich Mix. I'm talking about um, the Organization for Visual Arts that Sunil Gupta, who curated the fabulous show at the White Chopper that's already been mentioned, um, was w those were the kinds of organizations that were being set up by certain kinds of money. Um, I'm wondering, is there a perceived difference between those organizations and those that come under the RFO, the sort of centrally funded organizations? 
And is that difference, has, have those differences been harmful or healthy? And are those organizations born out of the cultural diversity agendas initi uh, or initiatives in effect, have they in effect um, widened that gap between the center in the UK and the periphery? Or are they the creation, in fact, to be celebrated of what the UK has in terms of uh, a fabulous ecosystem of different kinds of organizations, um, organizational, sorry, infrastructures. Um, so my first point is to keep the question of funding. We talked about patronage, I think, as a term in the, um, the, um, the sort of notes uh, for this seminar, but to think of funding in mind when listening to the various papers that are going to be delivered over the next two days, and to ask if the art histories um, of Britain and South Asia have been supported by certain kinds of funds, which have in turn constructed certain kinds of narratives. So when I set up Breaking Leaves, as I mentioned the day before being given this um, invitation, one of the comments that I got, in fact it was three comments of, my, of the many that I got that have never really left me and that was well done, Shamini. It's fantastic that you have the RFO money because I really think it was about time that the Arts Council had more black, minority, ethnic, BME organizations as part of its portfolio. So it was almost being told or asked, I suppose sometimes people sometimes say, I don't. I'm not a racist, but, and then blah, blah. I took that as such a shocking way to respond to something that I had set up because what I had set up was an organization that was dealing with an art form that was so far removed from the center, the artist book. <laughs> it's a minority art form in a certain way. It's always been that way. It's something that I felt that should have been talked about first before the ethnicity, the, as it were, the cultural diversity of what it felt like was being given a chance. Why wasn't someone saying, here's the Arts Council supporting something in organizational terms that is for an art form that gets so little support? doesn't occupy the mainstream, as I've mentioned, and it, I've always thought, you know, as, as we, we know historically from the sort of 60s, the provocation of the arts, this book is something that um, was always at arm's length to the art world. It was very much aspiring to circumvent it um, um, rather than be subsumed by it. Um, I think those kinds of politics are... Um, they were, they were um, very idealistic in many ways, but nevertheless, actually why I decided to set up something that was working with a form like the artist book, because up until then, my focus, my curatorial research and interest is Sri Lanka, modern and contemporary. And up until that point, um, to really get a chance to curate work around Sri Lanka, um, the opportunities were coming via, um, I suppose, the festivals, the, um, well, I didn't want to have to wait for another Commonwealth Games cultural project to come along to be able to do something about Sri Lanka. But more than that, it was a way of finding a more sort of strategic curatorial way to work with contemporary practices from Sri Lanka, and the book form gave me that. But it was also um, something that I want to raise, I suppose, this question here is to um, a concern I was having about, or a question, if you like, of the Indianization of the region. And if we just listen, have, as we've done to um, the range of speakers so far, um, of course, I think the point I'm making is that India has dominated the narrative. It's dominated the conversation. Um, and I'd like to call a sort of a question here into um, the conversations, into the papers that come about, um, to say we need to challenge this India-centric narrative when we talk of South Asia. The subcontinent, the Indian subcontinent is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Afghanistan, 
the Maldives. So it's not just a question of geography, but actually something else, which is that when we talk of the Indianized, or when I'm speaking about the Indianization of the region, it's to, firstly, I suppose, to evoke a very, I would like to see a more imperialistic map, because that imperialistic map brings in Sri Lanka. At the moment, Sri Lanka is left out. But for the time being, where we have the Indianization of the region, India has a certain, it, there's a certain geopolitics in play here. So I think it's well understood about India's relationship with Pakistan and Bangladesh, but in the case of Sri Lanka, the Indian relation, the, in, the relationship with India is very, very, it's problematic. Um, it's a long, a longer conversation to go into, but um, I think um, uh, a, an important event just to perhaps introduce here is the 89 uh, Lanka, um, India, Indo Lanka Peace Accord um, that was called um, uh, to try and rectify the ethnic conflict war in Sri Lanka, introduced the Indian peacekeeping force into Sri Lanka for th three or four years. They left in 1990. It was a disaster having ha ha the Indian intervention into Sri Lanka, and India paid the price. Rajiv Gandhi's assassination in May 21st, 20th, um, 1991 um, was as a result of that. India is viewed with huge suspicion in Sri Lanka from the point of the ethnic conflict because it gave, um, it paid for the arms coming into Sri Lanka through the LTTE. It was seen as a sympathizer for the Tamil Tigers. Uh, these things are uh, hugely debated, you know, hotly debated. And now it is seen as the enemy with China. It's coming to Sri Lanka um, for its economic interest. And they do say that if India pulled out of Sri Lanka, the economy would collapse. There is also in Sri Lanka a, a natural deep sea port, which is one of the deepest natural ports in the world, which has obviously huge nuclear interest from the Indian point of view. So I'm just talking about tensions that one might have with seeing India dominate. Um, but to return, I think, more germanely to what we're here to talk about is that when it comes to exhibitions, um, I, 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 I'm going to just cite one. There, there are, of course, so many. Um, but for example, the exhibition um, th where Three Dreams Cross, um, it was an exhibition, I think, um, of of immense importance. It was paradigmatic for the reasons, too, that it was being hosted by a major institution, um, and it was not a collecting institution, um, but also that it set out to tell the story of photography's development in the subcontinent according in the discursive information that came with it in the catalog. It did focus on India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. But by leaving out Sri Lanka, which in art historical terms meant that the show and, and the therefore the supporting information, it left out probably one of the most important photographers of the South Asian region. And his name is Lionel Wendt. And I think it's about looking at had the show included him, of course you can't, it's not about a sort of revisionist, I don't want to sound revisionist, but I'm just imagining had the show included him, that show would have had a very, I think, important but different development of photography in the subcontinent to tell. Namely that Lionel Wendt was one of the first photographers to be seen, if you like, in, in, uh, in the way he worked with experimental conceptual photography from as early as the 1920s. Another key component, I think, of having Wendt in the exhibition would have seen photography as a major part of the modernist movement. Wendt was a central, he was the bon vivant of the 43 group. His relationship to that 43 group, which is the equivalent, if you like, of the Indian progressives, would have been bringing photography into a discussion about modernisms, which is not just about painting. Furthermore, Wendt's introduction through that exhibition would have also seen, I think, an important part of how artist writings, Wendt wrote under a pseudonym and was very political. Those issues and those elements were missing 
And those are things, of course, that seeing a show like that makes one consider what the show could have also been. So I want to end there by just prompting us to think, I suppose, about those broader methodological um, questions about the Indianization of the region, not just in terms of scholarship and art history and exhibition making, but also in terms of the market, which I go back to as in funding, because I see Lionel went today, had he been in that exhibition, would have gained value art historically, but I see today that Lionel Rent is gaining recognition internationally via the market. Thank you.